Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. So it is the beginning of July, but I wanted to put up one more book review before I do my monthly wrap up. So today we are going to be talking about the latest release from Paul Tremblay horror movie. This book came out I like two weeks ago, I want to say. This edition is really, really cool. It does have this like nice um, red edging on it. Um, I really, really, really love the cover. I love kind of this like VHS moment on it. Um, and I was, uh, I guess, honestly excited about this book. And I was about as excited about this book as I was about, um, I guess, The Paul Bearers Club, which is Paul Tremblay's release last year. Um, and I'm kind of feeling the same way I did about the Paul Bearers Club. So background on my relationship with Paul Tremblay as an author. I discovered him uh, back during 2020 when I was uh, literally in quarantine in like April. Um, and I couldn't leave the house and I ordered A Head Full of Ghosts and I read it in like two sittings. I thought A Head Full of Ghosts was absolutely phenomenal. I thought it was scary. I thought it was witty. I thought the twist was incredible, even though it's kind of paying homage to like two other very famous horror novels. I really, really loved that book. And then I picked up Cabin at the End of the World, which similar to A Head Full of Ghosts, kind of known for its vague ending. And that's kind of been a criticism that a lot of people have had with Paul Tremblay before, is they're really unsure of um, what kind of statements he wants to say, because a lot of his novels end very, very vaguely. Um, and that just kind of, it continues. Um, you do see it in the Paul Bearers Club a little bit, but that wasn't really my issue with uh, that. And you will see it in horror movie as well. These endings kind of come out of like, left field and you're really just like, okay. That's kind of Paul Tremblay's thing. However, up until the release of Paul Bearer's Club, Paul Tremblay kind of wrote these fictional horror stories, which sounds very, very vague when I say it like that. But once you get to Paul Bearer's Club and horror movie, these like kind of like fun fictional stories in these world that he's, these cre in these worlds that he's creating, just kind of disappear. Um, and he tries to write what I believe to be autobiographies through a horror lens. I really wanted to love Paul Bearer's Club. I thought it was going to be about two kids who work in a funeral home doing like shenanigans and like weird stuff happens. That is not at all what that story is about. That story is basically a glimpse into Paul Tremblay's life in like I think high school and college and just a weird putting himself into a story and then creating a maybe potentially horror narrative around it about a girl who may or may not be a vampire. Um, really, really strange. Horror movie, unfortunately, for me at least, does the exact same thing. Our main character, very much to me, is Paul Tremblay. He is very much just kind of putting himself into his narrative and kind of creating this what if I was in a horror movie in the 90s that became kind of famous on like the um, if the horror movie kind of became like a cult classic in like horror forums um, and like the online world. It just wasn't scary to me and it wasn't necessarily a, a horror story to me. Um, a lot of what this book I think was trying to do really 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 missed the mark. I'm gonna read the inside flap and then I'm gonna kind of tear apart what this book is about. Um, so it says in June 1993, a group of young guerrilla filmmakers spent four weeks making horror movie, a notorious disturbing art house horror flick. The weird part? Only three of the film scenes were ever released to the public. But horror movie has nevertheless grown a rabid fan base. Three decades later, Hollywood is pushing for a big budget reboot. The man who played the thin kid is the only surviving cast member. He remembers all too well the secrets buried within the original screenplay, the bizarre events of the filming, and the dangerous crossed lines on set that resulted in tragedy. As memories flood back in, the boundaries between reality and film, past and present, start to blur. But he's going to help remake the film, even if it means navigating a world of cynical producers, egomaniacal directors, and um, surreal fan conventions, demons of the past be damned. But at what cost? Um, the horror movie is an obsessive, psychologically chilling, and suspenseful feat of storytelling genius that builds inexorably to an unforgettable, mind-bending conclusion. Um, unforgettable, mind-bending conclusion. I don't actually understand what happened at the end of this book because it wasn't thoroughly... I don't want to say explain, but it kind of came out of nowhere and like the kind of lore around the thin kid that Paul Tremblay created had so many plot holes in my opinion that the end was very unsatisfying. Um, okay, so this book is kind of told similar to the Paul Bearers Club where you kind of have like story and then you have um, 
what Mercy's edits where she goes through and like edits and has like her own commentary on what's happening with this you kind of have these like spliced moments of the thin kid who doesn't have a name his kind of storytelling and then it's spliced with the movie script the movie script is so unbelievably irritating in this I was kind of excited because I liked the, the format when I saw this book um but this I, I don't really read scripts I can't actually think I've ever read a movie script before so I'm not really sure how much the director likes and the screenwriters like to put in like a side notes um but this is such a case of like Paul Tremblay loves to show the reader what's happening and then immediately explain what he means by it in great depth through the use of this script there are so many asides in which the the writer is just saying exactly what the audience should be feeling when watching this film and I just don't think it's that deep and this book is trying so 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 hard to make it that deep and it just doesn't matter because all of these characters are very very flat um, and I actually found myself constantly getting Cleo and Valentina confused because they were so similar um, and one was like literally the only difference between the two is one allegedly was depressed and one allegedly was a spoiled rich kid but neither of those characters ever acted that way neither of those characters ever acted that way nothing in what they did or how they acted throughout the story um made me ever think that about them uh cleo's story end is it's very predictable because it's hinted at so often but there's no understanding as to why she does what she does uh the way her character is developed i literally don't understand her actions at all but neither do these characters either however the script seems to have these like hidden moments where it's like deep down inside we should understand it um and i just didn't get it again this just kind of felt to me like paul tremblay kind of reliving his glory days as a college student um and a, and a kid in his young 20s doing something fun a lot of this novel is set in the 90s and yet it just doesn't feel nostalgic to the 90s i've been reading a lot of books set in the 90s recently um and this is the first book to have that setting where like literally the only thing that makes me realize that it is in the 90s is the fact that practical effects and cgi aren't where the film producers need them to be that was kind of the only real like hindrance um so didn't love the lack of use of the 90s setting um and i just i found the characters just so one note and they were so like fleeting like carson really isn't needed at all in the storyline neither is the director marlene um or the other director or i guess he was like director of photography dan like there's so many like side characters that are just kind of there to push the plot forward and it just doesn't do anything for me um i really did enjoy the horror convention scene it reminded me a lot of the horror convention scene in ex boogeyman um i really really actually quite enjoyed the first half of that however the the arrogance of the thin kid really shines through and it's something that shines through throughout the book and felt very very misplaced like the way that he's talking about like kind of the, the indie horror author next to him who keeps writing like crappy books like why it's not like this character has done anything and i i wasn't sure if that was like a weird meta commentary on like paul tremblay being both like putting himself as this main character but also being like an indie writer like i don't know it was very meta and it was very very forced um so that was kind of weird and then the whole conversation over the pinky i just found again very very strange um and I think the reason that I found it so strange too is because there's so much build up to that scene and it's really really weird and then later down the road you're kind of like well did it even happen was it necessary you know I have so many questions about the guy's pinky and I just don't care about it and I have I have so many questions too about like what was real and what this guy was just kind of imagining um and I don't necessarily think the book needed to go that way just because if you take those elements out the book I think is actually creepier if you take kind of this weird is this supernatural element happening or not same thing with Paul Bearer's Club like it's just this kind of added aside to basically make the book a horror story and it adds absolutely nothing and I found the the ending just infuriating because I just don't care 
like it happened it's creepy it's gross it's weird it kind of comes out of nowhere but it's like I don't care and the book didn't give me a single reason to care um I liked this more than Paul Bearer's Club Paul Bearer's Club I had to really force myself to get through um I found it extremely self-indulgent this one less so and I think it was because um I just Paul Bearer's Club really focuses a lot on like music and like the music that um Paul Trembe yeah, that Paul Tremblay liked as a kid um, to kind of push his narrative forward. This one focused more on like just the love of being on a film set in general. So I definitely was able to read this more. Um, I enjoyed it just a little bit more, I think, because I connected with the subject matter just a little bit more than with Paul Bear's Club. But I mean, this was a three stars and pretty much only a three stars just because it was more readable than Paul Bearer's Club and I, I just don't know what Paul Tremblay is doing with his um, writing style right now. It's taken a complete um, turn from what it used to be and I used to really 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 enjoy it and now I just I don't want to read these kind of meta self-reflective coming-of-age horror stories that really aren't scary and kind of use cliches in horror to write a memoir. That's basically what this feels. This literally is the same story to me as Paul Bearer's Club. It's a guy, it's a girl. Are they in love? Are they not in love? Are they friends? Do their paths cross? One is kind of a misfit. One's also a different kind of misfit. Like one is, the, the girl is far more interesting than the boy and drags him into his, her world and just like takes him on this crazy journey that changes the course of his life. And then something very, very tragic happens to one of the main characters to kind of pull everything back together and like make the narrative worth telling to the world like it is the same freaking story and i'm over it i'm over it i i need paul tremblay to go back to writing the kind of styles that he did with cabin at the end of the world and a head full of ghosts where he's paying tribute to these kind of horror cliches and this oh, these, these twisty turny ideas and he comes up with these really new and creative concepts and doesn't just put his life in the story and try and say it's terrifying because it's just it's just not and it I just don't get it and I, this is not a book for me this is not um a style for me and it's something that I feel like I should love like I I love horror films I love um like 90s settings I love coming of age stories and just this this is not it this did not work for me and it is another one of those moments where like just absolutely amazing beautiful cover and I feel like it's a really cool idea just executed in just a completely different way than I was expecting. And this is exactly how I felt after reading Paul Bearer's Club, except it took me so long to get through Paul Bearer's Club. And this one I really just like forced myself to power through. Um, and the fact that it was half like a screenplay made it a lot easier than reading like essays that had like commentary and then like that was, that was so difficult to read. Um, just because I didn't enjoy it. So this was a three stars, a solid three stars. Like, it is what it is. I don't think I will pick up more Paul Tremblay if he continues to write in this style. It's just not a style that works for me. It's too meta, but it doesn't have a deep enough um, message for me to put up with kind of how ridiculous and strange a lot of it is. And I really try so hard not to like badmouth books and badmouth authors when I'm reading them, but this was just so frustrating for me because it literally is like a copy and paste of the same concepts and ideas as Paul Bearer's Club and I just really did not vibe with that book. Um, yeah, honestly, like again, the only reason this isn't a two-star read is because it did have a few moments that I did like and I liked it more than the Paul Bearer's Club, which sadly, it's just, it's not even saying that much. <sighs> trying so hard to be nice. Um, no, I didn't love this. Um, the one thing that I liked and I also kind of didn't like is like the, the weird um, crocodile imagery. I don't know why that was there, but like they, they cite, I think, I think the crocodile poem that they talk about in the poem is from, um, or that they talk about in the book is from Alice in Wonderland. And that kind of keeps coming back like subtly. And then at the very, very end, like I think crocodile is the motif, but I don't know. I think maybe also it's just like lizard in general. <laughs> I don't know. I just kept imagining the lizard from Spider-Man, like the, the bad guy from Spider-Man. 
um, and it just kind of made it almost comical for me, so I don't know. I, I don't know. It was, mm, it had this, like, element of wanting to be, like, very Blair Witch Project, and that would have been so cool if it executed it well, but it was just bizarre, and I didn't understand anyone's motivations. Like, m like, main characters aside, like, the motivation of the characters in the script within this story made no sense to me. The story made no sense to me, and it's trying so hard to be this, like, A24, like, super meta, um film and I'm like I don't get it and I, like they kept saying like oh like Cleo's putting herself in the narrative and I'm like yeah and, she, and she's telling the viewer exactly what she wants them <laughs> to understand and then they're like but maybe Valentina wrote the script and I'm like it doesn't matter because I don't understand anything like it, it's being over explained over and over and over and over and over again you're putting in so many asides and telling exactly what you want people <laughs> To understand and it just doesn't make sense because there's no motivations um and one more thing one more thing there's this scene where the script for some reason is describing this moment in the movie where there's it's just like a blank doorway and nothing happens for five minutes and there's no sound it's just frozen on a blank doorway and it's like seven pages to describe the five minute silence of just this empty doorway and I if I saw that in a film I would get up and leave and they talk about how like they expect people to be confused and get up and leave and it's this horror and it's this bends and I wanted to put the book down at the moment I oh my god I, I couldn't do it I was just like this is the most pretentious scene I have ever read in a book because it was so self-gratifying trying to explain to the reader and to the potential viewer how genius this scene was and I was like this is freaking ridiculous I hated that scene I hated that scene it got such a visceral reaction out of me and I was just like glossing over that whole scene in the script because I was just like I don't care the the just over explanation on the blank scene and silence it, it to me was just worse than when like some like old school 1800s author spends like three pages just like describing what a chandelier looked like. Like I just, I couldn't deal with it. It was un real. This book's only 273 pages and like seven of those pages talk about silence. I just, I can't. Anyways, three stars, not a fan, um, unfortunately. And that's a bummer because again, cool concept and I just, I wish it was executed a lot better. Anyways, that is all that I have for you guys today. As always, I try to post every Monday and Thursday, sometimes on Saturdays. And if you enjoy these videos, please hit the like and subscribe buttons down below, and I will catch you all in the next one. Mwah.